Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So just in a couple minutes, we're going to talk through the uh, L Brands model that you worked on for today's homework assignment, but a couple of logistics things coming up on grading. So first, uh, this is your current ranking as of right now. And the first half of the stock simulation ends at the end of class on Wednesday. Okay? So that's where the first grades <coughs> excuse me, will be taken. And so you don't have to sell anything. Uh, but at the end of the day, approximately 5 o'clock on Wednesday, I'm going to basically do a similar screen here. We'll rank the relative portfolio values. And who was ever in first? So five, four, four, three, three, two, one would be the grading. Okay. Now, subject to two things, uh, this team would be disqualified and get a zero for the entire first half of the semester because they didn't make a minimum of ten longs. So I'm hoping between now and Wednesday they make at least three more longs so that they're not disqualified. Right. So that's their hint. But you need to make sure this is at least ten. <clears throat> and the second part is that for the second half of the semester, we don't reset. So wherever you end on Wednesday, you continue. It's just a snapshot. And then you'll continue for the second half of the semester. And by the way, you would need 10 more. So for example, this team made no more trades. By the end of the semester, this number would have to be 55, regardless of how many trades you made in the first half of the semester. So it's a minimum of 10 longs each half of the semester, regardless of how many you made in the first half of the semester. So they would still need at least 10 more new trades. Okay, so just a, a quick update on the stock simulation. And <clears throat> I did get a couple questions about selling stocks. So if it's not clear, this is the trade I made in the first day of class when we were explaining this. If you go into your uh, area of uh, ownership of stocks, there's a little red X. It's called closing an idea. Why they chose that language, I don't know. But basically, that's what it means to sell the stock. So if you click on the red X, that's actually how you sell the stock. If you go in here, and instead of a red X, you see an orange like circle with a line through it, that means you haven't passed that one day holding window. Okay? But otherwise, once it's available to sell, you'll just close out your idea by clicking on the red X. That's how you sell the stock. But remember, for Wednesday, you don't technically have to sell because it'll just do a portfolio value at the end of the day. That's how you're going to be ranked against the peers in this section. All right, questions about the, the Bloomberg stock simulation? Any questions about that? Okay, <clears throat> so a couple more logistics items, then we'll get into our homework assignment. One of the other things that came up is that next week is your spring break. And hopefully you're going to a nice destination, but even if you're not, you get a week off from class. So I did notice that the Monday after spring break, the day you come back, we have a, a major homework assignment that is due that's worth 4% of your semester grade. And to be honest with you, if I were in your shoes, I really wouldn't want to do anything over spring break regardless regarding 443 or any class here at Maryland. I'd rather just enjoy my spring break and not do any work. So I took a vote in the 11 o'clock class. It was unanimous. So I'm not going to I didn't think I needed to ask anybody else, but we're going to make a change. So homework four, I'm going to change it to be worth two points, not four points, but we're going to do in class on Wednesday. Okay. So rather than doing it a week from or two weeks from today being due, it'll actually be due Wednesday, end of day, but you'll actually work on it during class. We're still going to have a class and I'll give you the assignment during class, but if you can finish it during class, you're done until you get back from spring break working on comments for this class. All right. So does anybody object to that in here? Nobody objected in the either or the other section. So I didn't think there'd be any objections. But yes. Just a question. If you can't make it to class on Wednesday, you can still do that. that It'll be due later. So you'll have time to do it. But you have to get it done. You have to find a way to get it done. So there'll be a video posted. Or no, there won't be a video posted. There'll just be an assignment posted. And you will have to go and get data out of the Bloomberg terminal to complete the assignment. Okay, because it's a scheduled class. You're not supposed to miss that at scheduled class. So I'm assuming that you're coming here for your scheduled class and working on your scheduled class. Yes? Is there a way to get the Bloomberg data today? No. I'm not going to give the assignment until Wednesday start of class. Because the whole point of an in-class assignment is I want people to do it in class. So if I give it to them before class, then they might do it and skip class. So I don't want to do that. 
So unfortunately, no, I won't be giving it today. It'll be available starting 11 a.m. on Wednesday. You can see it, but not before 11 a.m. on Wednesday. Okay. So here's how it then impacts things. So basically, the Monday after spring break, <clears throat> we'll have a regular lecture, but you don't really have to do anything other than show up uh, for that lecture. Yes? Sorry, can I come in earlier last time if I can't come? To sure. Austin, um, People rotate sections all the time, so you're welcome okay. to go to an earlier class. Uh, so again, in-class assignments that you'll work on on Wednesday, turn it in, <clears throat> enjoy your lovely spring break wherever it may be. The Monday after spring break, we will come back, we'll have a regular lecture. That Wednesday, the 28th, I believe this will be, will be our second midterm exam, midterm part two. And then the following Monday will be homework six. And that will actually be worth four points. That'll be a bigger assignment versus this homework being a smaller assignment, which will be in class. I'm just switching the points on that one as well. So this was originally going to be four points. Now the in class will be two points. And then the next assignment would have been two points, will then be four points. And it'll be a little bit bigger assignment. Okay, so here's the other thing you need to know about the midterm exam, midterm part two. Unless you make arrangements otherwise for a university approved excuse, then you will also take it during class time that you're scheduled for on Wednesday. So like midterm one, you don't have to physically be in this room, but you have to take it during the time of the section that you're registered for. Okay, so right now we're in the 2 p.m. section. So basically you'd have to take it between two and 3.30, okay? Midterm two, will be all qualitative, all right? So you won't be doing Excel modeling. You won't be using Bloomberg. You'll probably just be answering pure essay questions, okay? And it's really, do you understand <coughs> the concepts that you've been applying the math to for the first half of the semester, all right? Now, again, I haven't been covering directly what's in the book to this point because I've assumed that you understand what's in the book, otherwise you'd be asking about it. And I'm, I will say that I'm generally not gonna ask too many questions that we generally haven't covered in class, but anything in the book is also fair game. So make sure that you at least are familiar with those concepts and don't have trouble. So for example, I gave you one of the potential questions when we were doing a couple weeks ago, we we're building the model and I said, you know, hey, for PVH, if they're growing and more profitable over time, why isn't the CFI changing? Okay, so that's what I'll call a conceptual question. And so you'd have to explain that because we're not changing the payout, that that is actually causing the non-operating cash flows to grow because the debt and the equity cash flows are not changing over time. So that's what I mean by <clears throat> you need to have a conceptual understanding of what's going on. And that's what I'm going to assess on midterm two. Again, it's worth five points. You'll take it during class time. We'll do more. We'll talk more about it. Uh, when we get back from spring break that Monday, but that'll be the Wednesday after you get back from spring break. Okay. So questions about any of this? Yes. Um, I've like been looking at the tax book, but it's just a little confusing what we're doing like correlates with what in the tax book. So do you know what chapters we should be focusing on? Um, I think I still have the syllabus open from an earlier class. So basically, anything that goes through here. So 16, 10, 9, so basically 1 through 9, 1 through 10 and 16. And by the way, that's it for the semester for the, the textbook. Pretty much that's all the content that we're covering. All right. And again, some of it I, I'm not directly talking about. So for example, <clears throat> when we built the Enterprise DCF, one of the chapters was on multiple models that you can use to value a company on cash flow and then explain the process of each one, including a DCF, right? So I just kind of specifically went straight to the DCF model, but I assume that you understood it. You know, one of the chapters talked about ROIC and economic profit. So again, we didn't talk too much about economic profit, all, except we created a tab on it, but I assume that you read the chapter on economic profit and all the drivers of economic profit and why it's important. So that's what I mean by, I'm assuming that you're kind of paying attention to what's going on the content side, but as I said, that's really up to you guys. All right, and if you have questions about anything, bring it up. You have opportunities in class to do so, preferably before you take the midterm. All right, any other questions about any of this? All right, so again, today <coughs> we want to focus on L Brands and your last homework assignment, which was turning in four files, the as-is, <coughs> the bull, the bear, and the target. So let's go ahead and talk through Here's Excel, and here is the beginning of 
the as-is valuation. So one of the things you should have done is you should have taken the most recent L Brands data and basically put it in the model. And you should have come to the Assumptions tab. The most recent year they completed was 2018. You should have changed the WAC. Now, if you did the WAC last Wednesday, it was 8.6%. Today, the WAC has changed, just the nature of the real-time, real-world stuff that we're in. So if I go to L Brands, and it was 8.2% this morning, so let's see where it is right now, 8.2, okay? So you want to use the WAC at the time of your valuation, and here's also why we do screenshots. <clears throat> so part of the reason I'm, I'm having you do screenshots is to prove you did the work individually. Part of the work I'm having you do screenshots, and just ran your TA down the lunchroom, but, uh, but basically, so that when the TAs grade this, because literally the data would have changed versus last Wednesday versus this morning, like they can, if you have, for example, an 8.6 WAC, you're probably going to get a G close to 1%. If you have an 8.2 WAC, you're probably going to get a G closer to 0.4%. Okay? So in order for them to grade that appropriately, they have to know what your assumptions were at the time of your evaluation. Because that would be the point. If the WAC is higher, <clears throat> then the cash flows need to be greater to get to the same share price because we're going to discount those cash flows at a higher rate. If the WAC is lower, then the cash flows can't be as big in order to get to the same stock price. And that is just a change that would have occurred any time over the last three days. But nonetheless, basing it on now, 8.2. G is not going to be 7%. Okay, so we'd have to put in and solve for a G, but it's probably going to be closer to 1. So I'll go ahead and put that in there and then we'll adjust. Current share price right now is about 42, so 41.91 a share. <coughs> Shares outstanding <coughs> is 282.3 million. So we had to make sure that we did this. And we would have had to update the consensus estimates. So for EEO for 2019, 13.113. Uh, 13,573 and 14,502 for the EBITDA's 21,19, 22,42 and 25,35. For the multiples, 1.19 is EV to sales, and EV to EBIT, 9.21, giving us an estimated EBIT margin of about 12.9%. Yes? Uh, the number of analysts dropped a lot in that last year. Is it okay if Great point. So when we go to the ratios, this is what's changed this semester versus previous semesters. That's why you got to pay attention to what's actually happening in the current semester. But <clears throat> it used to be that I told people to only use the first two years. And that's all I required them to do, and they had to figure out years four through six. Uh, sorry, three through six. This semester, I'm giving you an option. So I'm saying, if you believe that the third year is forecasted enough, use the third year. If you think that it's not, drop the third year, come up with your own forecast. So this is why it's important to explain your assumptions, because in your assumption right up, you should have said that. You should have said, okay, I think that I'm only using the first two years because the analyst forecast had dropped off, and this is why I came up with the growth rate for year three. This is why I came up with a margin for year three. So to some degree, year three is discretionary. But even when you exercise your discretion, you're going to have to start explaining that I'm using my discretion, and this is why I'm, I'm using the number that I do use. And that's going to be important going forward for the rest of the semester. Okay, so assuming we did use the analyst forecast, let's go back. First, I need a tax rate. Again, I think it was in this class, somebody said that they uh, went through <coughs> the earnings reports, the quarterly earnings, they didn't see any reference to tax rate. And so that was going to be a challenge. So, and I made an announcement about this, but if you go to BRC, which is Bloomberg Research, you can see the um, information about that Bloomberg gives us access to. Now, again, they, we don't get all of the analyst reports because you got to pay for that stuff, and we don't. <laughs> but nonetheless, J.P. Morgan is one of the sources we get. And on March 4th, there was a J.P. Morgan report. 
So we can pretty much come to this report, read it, and what I was referencing is the J.P. Morgan report, which was on March 4th. Their earnings call was on the 28th. Based on the earnings call, he adjusted his model. This is, I guess, uh, Matthew Boss. And scroll, scroll, scroll. These were, where's on this page? These were the tax rate he was using going forward. And basically, he was using 27%. Okay, so that's why the number 27% would have come in here. Now, if through other research, you had come up with a slightly not slightly different number, and you could justify it with an actual source, then that would be okay. Okay, but that's the point. We need fact-based information, and this is at least one analyst that gave us this fact. Now, you could have also used the U.S. tax rate as a proxy because you could have said, not that anybody did, but if you did in the FA function, and if you had scrolled through the 10Ks, you would have seen in the segments <clears throat> that by geography, last year of the 12.6 billion of sales, 11.2 billion was in the United States. Okay, so even if you were lacking information, given that Congress just cut the tax rate to 21%, that you could have made an argument for something in the low 20s. Okay, that would have been acceptable and if, as long as you, again, base it on this. Hey, they do 90% plus of their revenue in the United States. U.S. just cut the tax rate to 21%, so I think the tax rate should be 23, something like that, state and local. Right? So, again, that's key, as long as it's fact-based. Now, if you said the tax rate should go down to 15% and 90% of their sales in the U.S., I'd question that because the tax rate in the U.S. is 21%. How do they pay 15 if the tax is 21? But nonetheless, that's actually how you could use a different assumption. But for this one, I gave you the hint, at least we're all using the 27 out of J.P. Morgan. Not that they're right, but at least it's an analyst data point that we can rely on. All right, so assuming 27, let's work through. The next thing we knew is that somewhere around 12, nine or 13, depending on the day you did it for the multiple, that this needed to be this number okay so basically this needed to be somewhere around 17 or 17 1 and that gets me to the 12 9 <clears throat> by the way if I go through what the analyst said and if I use the third year instead of sorry equaling this I do equals, uh, sorry, copy, paste, and if I equal this for the third year, then these would have been the third year analyst estimates. It kind of bows, goes up and then down to 17.1. You know, it doesn't, and you can see in terms of stock price, it's not going to make too much of a difference if we go from 17.5 to like 17.3 <clears throat> to 17.2 to 17.1. Like even with smoothing or rounding, you're gonna see the share price doesn't change all that much, okay? <clears throat> uh, as you change these couple of margins. So somewhere around 17.1 is what you need to get down to. And then the question is, what about the G? So at this G to get these two to match, like I said, it's gonna probably be something around point 004 is going to be our G, and at that, you're probably going to end up with a growth rate somewhere around 3%, which is going to basically get you pretty close to the current stock price. All right? And again, these numbers don't have to be exact because you're solving essentially an equation with multiple inputs, and a slight change in one input does affect the other. All right? But the point of the as-is valuation and the process that we're following <clears throat> is we're not interjecting our opinion, per se. What we're trying to do at this point is, as I said, using observed data in the market and the academic formulas, we're trying to understand what likely are the types of numbers the analysts had to plug in the academic formulas to get that output. Okay, And that's what we're going to do. And as I said, the numbers could slightly change because, for example, if you used a 6.7% uh, 
Where's the whack? I'm sorry, 8.6% whack. Then in order to get the higher share price, then this G would have been closer to 1%. Okay, so that's what I mean. It could actually change, right? Depending on the day of the week that you did the exercise. But what I'm telling you is you should probably get, depending on the day you did it, you should get a G and a whack close to this. You should basically get a margin of about 12.9, 13%, somewhere in that range. You should have an understanding at a 27% tax rate. That's what gets you this valuation. And that's the whole point of the as is, is what I know for, for better or for worse, that what the wisdom of the market is right now for L Brands, Victoria's Secret, is they think somewhere around 3% growth, 3, 3.5% growth, is probably what they're gonna get the next few years. And I think that the market does expect a little bit better margins than what they're experiencing this year. However, they're not going back to their historical margins, if I unhide these columns, where they were in their better years having EBITDA margins above 20%. Like it's a much more difficult environment going forward that the analysts are currently projecting for L Brands. And that's what we need to get out of our as is. So I'm going to pause and just ask for any questions. Anything I did or anything you did that you want to ask about. Because now's a good time to ask. Yes, sir. Well, and when we do the forward year, when you say that has to match, what has to match in this page? Um, the number that you get from here, so the 9.21, and then the one that the model uh, it, it gives out to you, you know, on the assumptions page? Oh, you're talking about? Yeah. Does that always have to be, no matter what you're doing, as is targeted? I wouldn't, I, w I never want to use the absolutes, but here's the point. What we're really trying to do is, we're using the key value driver formula, which is a, a perpetuity, to basically guesstimate how that math works to get to that multiple. And, and so that's the point is we're, we're putting in three assumptions that we're more comfortable with. Like we know the no plat, we have a good idea of the no plat, we have a good idea of a tax rate, um, or sorry, therefore we get the no plat. We have a good idea of the WAC. We have a relatively good guess at the ROIC. So we're just trying to make it all work to get that EV to EBIT, hence solving for the G. So, so the reason why we're trying to get them close is rather than just saying, hey, how do I figure out what the growth in perpetuity for a company is going to be and then actually put a number in, which is going to be very hard to do. I'm not saying we don't, we're not doing that, but rather than doing it that way, we're kind of using the formula to help us get closer. But I, I look at it as we're still throwing darts at a board. We just want to get closer to the center. Right, and so as long as we're reasonably close, that's what I said, whether it's 0.4% or 1%, what does that tell you? I'm asking you, what does that tell you? If I told you it was 0.4 or 1% for a company's G, what would that tell you? This is the, this is the qualitative side. What does a 0.4% G tell you? Exactly. So that's the point, is that what we know is the market's not expecting a lot of growth from L brands going forward. And that's the important part to get out of this. Right? So whether it's half a percent or one percent, hey, the economy's growing at two to three. Except right now it's growing more than three. G is one, so they're not growing as fast as the economy. That's what I'm getting out of this that I need to know as I do my valuation. That's the belief of the marketplace. Now whether I agree with that, I could change that in my target, but nonetheless, this is what the market kind of has to believe to justify the current price. There's a little bit more pessimistic view on Victoria's Secret. Now, here's the other thing, because somebody asked about the G, and they said, well, what does G really mean? And this is what I mean by you gotta read the book, and if you don't understand these terms, ask in class. Don't just sit there passively thinking, I don't know what it is, and I'll look really dumb if I, don't, if I ask the question. Like, it gets worse for you when it actually impacts your grade. So don't care about what your classmates think. Make sure you understand these concepts. So let's go back to G. What the G represents is perpetuity growth of cash flow, or specifically free cash flow in our case, or earnings if we're doing an ROE. So here's the implicit assumption we're making, which is 
At a similar level of productivity and at a constant margin, growth in free cash flow is proxied by growth in sales. Okay, so that's why we're using growth in sales and growth in cash flow really almost interchangeably. Because we're assuming that if the sales grow and everything stays kind of constant, that the cash flow will go at that rate. But ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to solve for a growth in cash flow. Right? So here's the next thing, <clears throat> which is this is a perpetuity value. So if you're a company like Johnson & Johnson, you're probably going to be around in 30 years, you're probably selling consumer products going to grow with the market. So that's why most mature, established companies that are around for a long period of time are going to grow around GDP. However, let's take Apple as a special case. I think we can all agree that Apple right now is probably at the pinnacle of their performance as the best performing company in the history of the world. And if we could jump 15 years into the future, Apple 15 years from now is probably not going to be doing as well as Apple today. Okay, could we all reasonably agree on that? Yeah. And do we all reasonably know why I would be making that assumption? Right? One, that's kind of what the book said when they did the long-term ROICs. Nobody in the top quintile stays in the quintile forever. It's just Darwinism. So here's the point. If Apple goes from 60 billion of free cash flow per year to 30 billion of free cash flow per year over that period of time, what's their G? If Apple goes from 60 billion to 30 billion, what's their G? It's negative. Does that mean Apple's going away? No. no. It just means that Apple has peaked and they're not going to do as well in the future as the performance. So you got to be clear about your G's. A negative G doesn't just mean that the company's going away. Now, if I were to go to a different company, like GE right now, people might actually be worried about whether GE stays in business 20 years from now. Ironically, 20 years ago, we were talking about GE the way we were talking about Apple, right? Now they're in a far different situation, and therefore their G has been negative over time. So again, it's just perpetuity where we are now to explain where they're going to end up in the long run. Put that in the context of Victoria's Secret. What's the market really saying? If we have a half 0.5% G, what's the market really saying? Yeah. That they're growing, it's kind of limited. And well, I wrote that. The reason why I have such a low G is my opinion is because I felt like with so much price competition and like rise of competition also from a generic brand and just the way the market how the retail industry is continuously changing, yeah. where like it's, it's going to affect everyone's bottom line because now net income and like sales are going to go down. Uh, many analysts are now pessimistic on whether this company will continue to grow as a leader based off the strategy they have right now. Like, they're not doing anything innovative. Like there's something innovative about the career. So, so let me summarize. They peaked. The analysts in you believe they peaked, and that the times going forward are tougher. So again. Uh, and and we're, we're going to get to these relevant points in a minute. We talk about the bull and the bear. But I'm saying if you think about it as a perpetuity is the, the broad sword approach, not the scalpel that's just trying to explain everything in the perpetuity for their growth. And the, the very headline is they peaked and they're going to struggle with their growth going forward compared to what they've done in the past. And hence, lower G. All right? It's not like they're going away. It just means tougher times in the future than what they've experienced and that's the way the market is pricing them so it's no surprise that the consensus is what he just described because basically that's indicative of what we're seeing as we teased out these assumptions in our as is note that at this point I'll keep repeating this it's not whether we agree with this when you do as is it's not your your opinion okay that's the target. The target is your chance to interject your opinion. Okay, This is not your opinion. This is just observing data and, in a way, solving plausibly the data that's in the model. Okay, So from here, we then go to our bull and our bear. Okay, Now we want to establish the bookends of the range. All right? So let's go ahead and save this as our as is. File, save this as our bull. So the point when we get to the bull model is we want to start talking about the optimistic scenario. Okay. So what I was telling the previous classes is this morning I was actually on the phone with a, a bank in Asia. The guy I was talking to was in Hong Kong, so he's 12 hours ahead of me. So it was late at night for him, really early in the morning for me. But the whole point is 
It's about helping CFOs that work for this big bank do better jobs as CFOs. And, and this is the insight I'll give you, which is I as an outsider cannot go into a bank and talk to a bank country CFO and know more about banking than they do. Matter of fact, they probably could teach me a lot about banks and risk management and, and how you actually manage, particularly in very specific countries. So that's the point. The problem that this bank has, and a lot of other banks have, and companies do the same thing, this is where I exist, is that it's not that they can't solve the equations. They're better at the math than I will ever be. It's just they have to think about what goes into the equations. They have to go and think about what goes in the math. And that's the part where finance people fall down. All right. So now I'll just make a more generic comment, which I made before, but I, I think it's important to understand the context of the bull and the bear, which is what you're good at, this is the bias, is you're good at solving equations. And that's to some degree what we just did. That's the plug and chug. All right. You know how to solve equations. What makes finance people uncomfortable is when they don't know how to solve an equation. And so here's the point of moving you out of your comfort zone. The key to this part of the analysis is linking the assumptions with the numbers. Like, I don't care at this point for your bowl what your number is as much as what your assumption was that led to that number. And that's what we have to get good at marrying together. And that requires practice. And by the way, that's a very important skill to have in the real world because a lot of people don't have that. Okay, so let's talk about this. So when we do the bowl, what we want to say is, what's a realistic 12-month price target if everything goes right in a rosy scenario? Intrinsic value, the company will eventually trade to this. So let's talk in terms of facts regarding L brands that we know that would actually be, what would be optimistic around these ratios. What could we change? Yes? Uh, we know that because at least 85% of the sales are in the United States, any potential trade war, it's not going to affect your international business. Well, no, it's not going to affect our business that much just because most of our sales are inside the U.S. So you think of that as on the bull scenario. That actually helps them. Yeah. Okay. So what helps them do better on sales in the next 12 months, just generally? Um, well, where, when I looked at this company, I knew that um, obviously because like the company's moved, all of retail slowly moving towards e-commerce, mm -hmm. there's going to be less expenditures. Or, there's there's going to be less operating expenses that they're going to have for like in, for having inventory, well, inventory and all the spacing they have for those properties and the retail and everything. Just because now like, they're being a little more efficient because they're going online. Okay. And so let's that, just let's just stop there, parse that out. So you're making two assumptions. And that's important to explain this in the assumptions that number one, there's going to be a growth in online. Okay. And that that is something that right now, Victoria's Secret and L Brands has been a little behind the curve on. And the key word you'll hear in there is called omni channel, which means it's a, it's a blend of online and in store. But the point is that they will do more online. And you're making a second assumption that they will be successful at selling online more stuff at better margins. Yeah. That they're actually be good at that. Because there's a wider market they're appealing to online versus having a store in like a mall, a store in a mall in the middle of nowhere. So with that in mind, let's go back to the growth rates. If they were more successful online, and could they be successful elsewhere in selling more stuff besides online? And anybody else, where else could they be? Yes. So trade war aside, let's just assume, I'm saying trade war aside, they have a big opportunity, particularly in China, to grow into that kind of emerging, you know, behemoth mar marketplace. So that could really help their sales as they get a bigger pie internationally. So they got the bigger opportunity online, the bigger <laughs> opportunity international, particularly in China. All right. So that could help their growth. Anything else that could help their growth that you guys read about? Yeah. Moving into like the sportswear industry. So they're behind the people like the Nike, Nikes, Adidas, Under Armour that are there. But just as people are going into their business, they are going into athleisure. Particularly, aren't they doing that with their pink brand? Yeah. So what do they say about pink? Yeah. Basically, pink is targeted towards the college age students. And there's a hope that if college age want to get put on pink as they grow older, they'll go on to the Okay, which would get better same store sales for them, and again, a, a better overall loyalty because people are staying kind of within their brand architecture. So let's just go back. So let's quantify this into some numbers. So 3% becomes what? If all these things were somewhat successful in actually happening, what does 3% become? Five? Okay, let's put in five. 
And what does our G become? 1%? I mean, if they're growing long-term a whole lot faster in China, you think that's a 1% G versus where they are now? I think it'd be higher. All right, let's, let's just be even conservatively, too. Well, now we're $54 a share. All right, and oh, by the way, we haven't even gotten to the margins. So if they are successful doing these things, so converting pink sales to Victoria's Secret sales, we get people hooked on pink. If they go into omni-channel, which is better margins after the initial expense of building it up, and if they go into international markets where maybe they have less competition initially and are getting better margins, what kind of margins could they get? Higher than 17? How high? Is it going to be the glory days of the past? So maybe not 20, higher than 17. All right, let's be optimistic. They get to, not 1.5, 18.5. And again, any ramp up here, just put it in the middle to be, let's put some numbers in here. Well, guess what? We're at a $62, $61 stock price. And oh, by the way, tax rate, 90% of their sales in the U.S., 27% still seems a little high. So could their tax rate be a little bit better? All right, I don't think we'll be below 21, but I don't know, 25? I think that's unreasonable for the next few years. Or maybe this year, 27, and next year, 25, or even lower. Again, that's not going to change it too much, but it's about a dollar per percent of tax rate that would add to their share price. So now we're into the low to mid 60s. Questions about this? Could it be higher? Can any of these numbers be more aggressive? I mean, if we really think that China is going to be bigger, maybe this number should be 3%. That they're really cracking the door open. Now, here's the point. Whether or not we say two and a half, two or three for G, whether or not we say four and a half, five or six for actual growth rates year by year, whether or not we say 17 to 18 percent margins, <clears throat> we got to have a story to back it up. And to me, what matters less is your number than your story. Because think about the other side of it. If I work for BlackRock and I've hired you to analyze L brands, what matters to me more is not whether you say four, four and a half percent growth, but you give me the catalyst. You help me understand what it's going to take to make these numbers approximately come true. And this is what I'm going to be looking for as I start to understand Victoria's Secret and L Brands. All right, and so that's why we want to put these two together with our assumptions. All right? Does that make sense? By the way, I'm not saying that we should copy the marketplace, but it's interesting if you look at the actual analysts. There is an analyst that came out from Baird on March 8th that's got a $63 share price. I'd be willing to bet if we could get our hands on this report and we read the summary of the first two pages of that report, he's talking about a lot of the same things we're talking about right now. And he's using those as his catalyst for a $63 stock price. All right, and he's one of the buys on L Brands. All right. So I'm saying without even looking at report by Baird, we actually have a pretty good idea of what that Baird report's going to say. Because we're all looking at the same data. He's just taking a more optimistic view, so his target is closer to what we would call the bull. Okay? But these are the things that are going to be important for that bull to come true. Questions about this? So again, whether your answer for your bull was as high as mine, a little bit lower, as long as you're being reasonable and somewhat fact-based, and that's what I said, there's a little bit of an art to this that requires practice, that's what we're starting to practice and understand we need to be able to do. Now, if I got to this point, save, file, save as, bear. What would be the more pessimistic things that could help in the L brands? that might negatively impact their share price over the next 12 months. And what would some of those be? Yeah. Uh, the fast fashion continues to take over uh, market share. Okay, so fast fashion really starts to hurt them. And keep going, it's good. 
What else would you put in there? Um, maybe their tax rate is uh, Okay, so let's put the tax rate back to 27. So, yeah, go ahead. You could also say a few years down the road that the new president, it goes higher than 27. So you could put a small probability, but there is a scenario that, you know, if the Democrats retake Congress, that the tax rates could go up, right? Now, I don't know how plausible that is in the short term, but at least it's something we could put in our horizon to think about these companies. Yes? Um, I also wrote that um, if you look at the gateway, like, there are a couple concerns I have with retail in general. This is one price competition, obviously, because, like, with, in, with any retail, there's nothing really innovative about any retail company. So, obviously, another, like, a bunch of generic, like, store, uh, generic retail brands could come up in China or anywhere internationally. That could probably make the same exact thing for much cheaper prices. And honestly, with like similar to fast fashion, when people are just looking for an item, they're not looking for the brand that much. If they're trying, if they're able to find a bra that's like sixty percent lower on a, a another place that's just as good as Victoria's Secret, they're probably going to opt for that. So it's probably competition from um, generic brands. There's also comp There's also like with any retail, um, when you have inventory, like obviously people, like companies are going to start cutting prices eventually. Like it's like for like for example an iPhone like you're probably gonna see it the same price every year but like for like for the fleece like your prices are probably gonna start going down after a couple of months when they're trying to get the new inventory in and if it's high inventory then you're probably gonna see your net sales going down even more because they're trying to cut down prices try to break even off that and obviously they're not really if you have so much retail that uh, retail space is still open they're not really efficient with their op with their assets so that means like their operating expenses are still probably gonna be high because they still have an empty. Retail space that's not going to be used to sell anything. Else. But let's um, <clears throat> let's go back through your series of statements and pull out some assumptions, which not necessarily everybody will agree with or disagree with. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but you are making some very specific assumptions in your statements. So, for example, when you said, you know, women will trade out basically bras across brands for lower prices, what's implicit in that <clears throat> is you're saying that there's a commoditization that's going on in retail. And that commoditization is allowing for switching costs to be lower and people to switch across brands, right? And, and I'm just saying that would be a bare scenario <clears throat> that Victoria's Secret is being knocked off by people and women are more willing to just trade off and not worry about the brand. So it also goes to assumption number two that the power of the brand is actually under threat. And that is a challenge for Victoria's Secret. So I'm not saying what you're saying is incorrect or not. But what I'm saying is even when we make comments like this, like, he actually made about six different financial assumptions in those statements, and what we have to get better at is articulating those that come out of our story. So I like the story, right? The aspect of storytelling is very important in finance, and you're going to actually remember this as we go through the class. Like, what we're going to get to is we're eventually going to tell the story of our, our report. Our report is kind of like a story. But along the way, we got to articulate the assumptions that we're making, and those are some of the key assumptions that are getting lower sales, Lower margins, less storm, same store sales, etc., and tying it back. Yes. Um, Good. Please. One of the assumptions I made was that concerning <coughs> their expansion into China for the bear scenario that money goes successfully, seeing as in their report they see the first two stores that they opened mm -hmm. didn't do as well because the bands they were offering did not fit more Chinese. So that so that, that could be an, a lack of market, market understanding. Yeah. <laughs> that could really hurt them. In fact, nobody's even mentioned this so far. But what about counterfeiting? Counterfeiting is a huge issue in China. In fact, counterfeiting is something that Amazon is running into right now. And major brands are threatening to pull their stuff out of Amazon because literally you're seeing exact replicas of American brands on Amazon sold by Chinese companies that are not authored by the American company. <clears throat> and that could be a real problem as you go into China, particularly with clothing, because it's really easy to knock it off and say it's a Victoria's Secret product, even though it's not a Victoria's Secret product. By the way, last time I was in Beijing and Shanghai, like there's stores in a mall that look just like an Apple store, right? Except they're not Apple stores, all right? But you couldn't tell if you walked in. Like the stores are white. They have all the counters and the tables. They got people with blue shirts with Apple logos on them, but they're not Apple stores, okay? And there's nothing Apple can do to shut them down. All right, it's the whims of the Chinese government. So I, I go back to this because this is a problem we didn't really talk about, but this could also be international sales and how that impacts the pricing and the amount of counterfeiting that goes on. You're going to make a separate point? Oh, I, I saw that um, Victoria's Secret has 71% of 
Um, of their stores were located in malls, but like okay. in retail. But that's an important fact because why is that important? Uh, I was saying for revenue growth. Like yeah, that. and if, if malls are under threat, then that actually could hurt a lot of their sales short term because even though I want to go to Victoria's Secret, if I'm not going to the mall, it's hard to go to Victoria's Secret. So that could actually impede their growth if we have further deterioration in the mall landscape. Really good insight. Yes? Um, also, I read somewhere that that online and mobile shopping is headed to be 45% of retail sales. So even if um, that is the case for Victoria's Secret and L Brand other, their operating expenses are going to go up because of all the shipping costs. Otherwise, but like even if either way, it's going to be they'll lose revenue based okay. on other people shopping online and other stores, or they'll increase their operating expenses. So since you're, since you're bringing these points up and you've heard the rest of this conversation, help me translate this into some bear scenarios. So what kind of growth rate should I put in here? Should I put in 6855? What should I put in? Um, I said like 3.5 to, to 3.4. So 3.5 down to 3.4? Yeah. Okay. Now here's the thing. <laughs> you're not saying that they're going to shrink. You just think that this is going to impede their ability to grow. That's an important point that we're, we're actually saying here. So we're not saying even the bear scenario that they're going away or they're shrinking. It's just they're, they're going to struggle with a lot of the growth because it's going to be offset by some of these other challenges. What would you say about the margin? Um, I went down to like in 20 to 20 to 15 mm -hmm. and then to 15 and 14.5. All right. So it gets really tough and they get to a 14.5 margin. What did you do with the tax rates? Leave it around 27? Yeah. And what did you say about the G? Um, I put back by 0.45 for my original G. Where are these extra numbers coming from? So that is the share price of 31. 31.75. By the way, Here's an analyst from Jefferies that came out last week at 30. I'd be willing to bet that a lot of the things that you guys just mentioned are talked about in that Jefferies report. That's their bear scenario. He's probably close to the end of our bear range. So that's the point. We at least have said, okay, here's 3175. Here's the numbers for the 3175. Here's our rationale for the 3175, the five or six things that we just talked about. Here's our bull scenario up around 70. Here's the five or six things that would lead the bull scenario. I've given you my range. And before I even give you my opinion, I'm not only giving you the range, I've given you the why of the range, right? And the why isn't just the number. The why is the types of things that will lead to those numbers. But it also tells me that what you're also telling me is Victoria's Secret's not falling off the table, right? They're not going to shrink, right? They're not going to negative growth. They're just not experiencing as much growth. And <clears throat> that omni-channel slash online is a big unknown. And that's the point. Like if we think that online is going to be good for them, well, guess what? That's more towards the bull side. If we think that they're going to struggle going to omni-channel and going to online, and they're going to continue to have problems with this, that's more towards the bear scenario. If we think that they want to expand their international presence and they're going to be successful doing it, that's the bull scenario. If we think that they go into China and they start to realize Oh, sizing's completely different. Styling's completely different. We can't just sell the same stuff we're selling in the rest of the world to this marketplace, and that could be a problem, and we don't understand that. Well, maybe it's going to take longer for them to ramp up. It'd be harder to penetrate. That's more towards the bear scenario. So even if I'm not right or wrong about the direction, I understand what the catalysts are going to be to go in the other direction. So I may not even just agree with your target, but I can at least understand what's going to be important to the range. That's what makes you valuable. Questions? All right. So we got our bookends. Now we want to go to our opinion. And again, there's not necessarily a right answer to this, but what would you say as a target price for L Brands? What's the target? Anybody on the sell side. So plus or minus 10% is a hold. So if we're at 42, anybody below 38 in your target. So how low were you? Um, I 
was at 35. You're at 35. Anybody else below 38? All right, so we had one person at 35. I'm assuming it's for a reason we talked about in our bear. Anything else I, that we... I just felt like the questions and specifics opinion base. Yeah. I don't think it's going like negative growth. It's going to disappear, but... But why is that your opinion? Meaning, take, taking out our scenarios, we have to kind of talk about each one. Why did you end up more, more negative on that? Well, what was your personal feeling on that? Although I saw that bed, bath, why did I keep on saying bed, bath, and, bath and Body Works was gaining revenue, I just saw that Victoria's Secrets, although they're trying to go towards wear everything in sportswear, it's not necessarily their market and not what they're known for. And I feel like they won't catch up to that curve as fast as other companies are already there. Okay. And I also felt like, seeing as in China, I felt like, Maybe it's just me, but I just felt like it was a very dumb move to go to China <laughs> with a store assuming that they're the same size when any market researcher can tell you that their tastes and even their individuals who shop there are different. Why mm -hmm. would you ever give them a full-out store? You'd be surprised at what is common sense in the corporate world, but that's a good point. But that's just what kind of drew you to All right. It's You're kind of shaking your head and laughing. Did you have a... Uh, I used to work at Victoria's Secret. Ah, so we got some personal experience in the room. Um, and... <laughs> Okay. Um, Where did you end up, by the way? Are you on the buy side or? I was on the whole side. You're on the whole side, okay. Um, the biggest thing that I thought, too, um, the Troy Secret invested a ton of money in the Tom Keys, too. They invested like $100 million into or $100,000 or something like that into their employees. They really emphasize the store experience, not, mm -hmm. like having strong customer loyalty by making your in store experience huge. But the foot traffic and retail has been declining for a long period of time. And I think all of us saw like our original G down pretty low, like below 2%. Or below 2%. Yep. And the fact that they're not investing into online, like as more consumers are taking the convenience route, um, by not translating that customer experience into customer experience online, I think that's going to be their biggest hit, despite the fact that they're still trying to grow and they're still trying to do business. They're still not making that jump. So okay, those are really good insights. Oh, just a quick follow up. <clears throat> so I assume, and I don't want to pry too much, but you were probably closer to minimum wage? Uh, we were actually pretty. Like okay. starting was, I want to say $3 above but, but here's the question. As as labor costs are going up, particularly around minimum wage rates, is that also going to affect their labor costs at their stores? Are they going to have to start paying more for the people in the stores that they have versus what they've done historically? And is that going to basically put a little pressure on their margins? Because to maintain that store experience, like, you know, if you looked at whatever, what's our current unemployment rate? For, I don't know what they're telling you in your econ classes, but I remember when I took econ, like anything below 5%, they called full employment. So it's pretty much hard to find even unskilled waker, wages these days, uh, unskilled workers, to basically fill these jobs. So that could put some wage pressure, as you just mentioned that. Yeah. Um, I saw, like, what Adam spoke about, like, how they haven't integrated chat boxes yet, like chatbots in their, um, like, website. So mm -hmm. if they're so good with, like, the consumer experience in store, maybe that can translate somehow online and they can adapt some type of their model <coughs> to these bots uh, just for the pure fact that they haven't done it yet. So that is some, you know, sign of growth yeah. or opportunity. But it's also a good question of what is a good online experience. Yeah. Because for me, my definition of an online experience is I like the one-click Amazon experience, you know, point-click done. And, and that doesn't sound like the type of experience that Victoria's Secret has been talking about or even translating online. So defining that and, and what it means, I, I still think they're probably trying to figure that out. Um, but nonetheless, where, where were you? Are you on the um, target I a, side? I was a little higher. What's, what was your target? Uh, my target was 50. 
pretty okay. much. Okay, so you're a little bit more on the optimistic side. Yeah, I like to move into like the sports where I think brand still matters there more mm -hmm. than another retail. You have Nike, Under Armour, Adidas, <clears throat> Lululemon. So here's the point. Um, you're less worried about the competition. You see the opportunities. Yeah. And that could be a differentiating point because the other piece is implementation. You're giving them more implementation credit than she did. Right, she's more concerned about their ability to implement. You're less concerned about their ability to implement. Difference of opinion in the stock prices. Yes. Also going back to um, Victoria's Secret going into China, they were actually pretty smart about the timing of it because, I mean, this past year, their, the Victoria's Secret fashion show was in Shanghai right mm -hmm. around the time that they opened one of the first and then their second store. So it's kind of like good, ex it's like incredible exposure for them in China because <laughs> when the, when all the models are in Shanghai and around, people are going to want to buy all this Victoria's Secret stuff. No, and, and again, they're, they've had a lot of success, historically. So it's not like they don't know what they're doing. Um, and and they're, they're making some right moves. So it goes back to, you know, will they overcome these challenges? And is that our opinion in the future? Or is it something that doesn't matter because it's just systemically, there's just some big structural issues that they're swimming against the tide that's really going to hurt them? So to some degree, that's what you're trying to help me understand in terms of, a, the bull and the bear, and B, your opinion tells me what you think of their ability to execute in this environment. Because that's where, and there's differences of opinion, which is okay, and we see that in the real world. There's not necessarily unanimity, but again, what I keep going back to, and that's why I'm going to keep hammering on this, what's key is help me understand the basis for doing this. Explain your assumptions. Because if we have a healthy dialogue about assumptions, that's better than having a healthy dialogue about the numbers even though we're actually having a dialogue about the numbers without using numbers. If you just give me numbers and I don't understand the assumptions, then we can't really have a healthy dialogue because arguing about four versus two, we can do that all day long, but why four and why two? All right, at least now I understand across even the three of you how each of you have a slightly dis different opinion. You're more pessimistic, you're more optimistic, you're more in the middle, and, and then at least I can base my judgment on understanding that information and your bias. So again, <clears throat> I'm not going to give you a, a final answer on this one because this one is it depends. All right? And I think you can actually have all of you could each get credit for it so long as you're kind of following this process and you'll continue to practice this. Right? If I were to do this myself, I'd probably put them close to the hold sell range. I, I actually think they're going to have more near-term challenges even though they have long-term challenges or long-term opportunities ahead of them. I think they're going to struggle with that. I think they're going to struggle with online. I think you made the really good point about the amount of malls that they're in and how that is a problem uh, that I don't think they can solve short term. And I think that entering new markets is harder than people think it is. And that unfortunately, competitors are here much more aggressively than they were even 10 years ago. They don't have the space to themselves. And even on the pink side, a lot of what they're doing now is catching up with other brands. They're no longer the leaders in pink. They're playing catch up to the athletes athleisure marketplace. So regardless, I'm not saying they're going to struggle, but I, as I said, I think they're probably more fairly valued and I'm kind of in line with most of the analysts, but that's what I said. That's what makes this kind of interesting. All right. Questions, comments, concerns, crippling fears about any of this. <clears throat> All right. So this is basically going to wrap up where we are for today. So again, on Wednesday, come prepared with Excel, ready to go to work on another company, which we'll do as part of an in-class assignment before we head out for spring break. Okay. Otherwise, we are done. And make sure that team that didn't do that trade, get your 10 trades. Uh, you're at 10 now? Okay, you did one during class, so that you actually are not disqualified from the competition. Good. All right, see everybody on Wednesday. Um, the comment on the